So this is an Ask Me Anything episode. We're talking mostly about speaking and how I've handled some sticky situations and also some advice that I would have if you're thinking about getting into speaking, some mistakes to avoid because I always want you to look like a pro right from the get-go. Let's get on to the show. Well, welcome back to another episode of Be In Demand. And today I'm going to be answering some questions from my audience. I Every once in a while, you'll see on Instagram that you can get your questions answered as well. So if you're not following me on Instagram, be sure to head on over to my handle is laurianne.mirabito. And that link is down below. So every once in a while, I will ask the audience like, hey, ask me anything. So today I just kind of like picked a bunch of very speaking related questions because I also had some questions about my fitness routine. But here are some of the questions. Um, What are a couple of speaking tips that people don't think of that make a huge difference? And one of them is pausing. Pausing is really powerful. So Anytime that you ask the audience a question, you want to give them space to answer. We as human beings, whenever we ask either ourselves or you ask somebody else a question, we automatically want to answer that question. So give yourself yourself, and give your audience the space to actually answer that question. Virtually making eye contact, always looking to the camera when you are speaking virtually. But if you're at an in-person event, being sure not to just look at the people that are right in front of you, but also the people that are what we call in the back of the room. You know, in theater, the back of the room is considered the cheap seats. So you want to make sure that you acknowledge the people that are sitting in the back of the room, that are sitting off to the side, not just the people that are in the front. Now, also, I want to share here that if you are in a large room and there's a lot of light on you and you can't see the audience, that's when there can be like a little bit of a disconnect. But preparing yourself mentally for a situation like this will really help you out in the moment. I was speaking it for a small audience but it was in a theater and there was a lot of light on me and it was really hard for me to see the audience. But because I knew of the situation, I still know like you still want to look to the back of the room, like as if you can see those people, knowing that on the other side of these lights, there are human beings that you need to connect with. So also don't hesitate smiling you know, depending on what you are talking about, I mean, if it's something very heavy and very sad, you don't want to be smiling. You don't want to have that disconnect with your body language to what you're talking about, but being just very mindful and of your body language, what you're talking about, but also just connecting with the humans that are in your audience. So that's that. That's the first question. Next question I got is, how do you get paid to speak? And what is the going rate for a new speaker? I get this question all the time. How do you get paid to speak? You got to find out if there is a budget for speakers. I say plural. This is part of my pre-questionnaire when somebody is considering having me as their speaker. I will ask them, you know, like, what's the date? What's the location? Is it in person? Is it virtual? Um, Is it a retreat? Is it like a high-end mastermind? Like I'll ask them these questions and part of it, you know, like the very last question is, what's your budget for speakers? So it's plural because I might be able to save them by doing another session. I'm already going to be there. My day rate is my day rate. So if I can save them some money by not having to have hire another breakout speaker, I'm happy to do that for them. And it also just like makes me look like, you know, like I'm helping them out. But you know, it's also me being able to be a keynote speaker, and then possibly a breakout session, you know, I've got more time with people that are in the audience. And those people that I can have more time with might potentially hire me in the future. So you have to ask, you have to find out. What's the going rate for a new speaker? There is no going rate for a new speaker. You know, if you look at yourself as a new speaker and you can only earn like maybe $200 or $500, if that's how you're coming across, 
Well, then that's what you're going to get paid, you know, if there's going to be an honorarium. So there's all different ways that speakers can get paid. I literally have um, done some work for companies that had the most unbelievable AV department. And I remember telling them after I spoke, I was like, you know, you could actually give people video in exchange for their speaking fee. That's how massive their AV department was. Um, I did get paid for that particular one, um, but it was just, and and getting part of the video um, is always part of my my agreement with them. I always, and you always ask, you know, what's the worst that they can say? They can always say no. What do people look for when hiring speakers? Well, first off, one of the things that I tell my clients is, does it say that you're a speaker in the bio and you're anywhere on your social media bios? You know, is there a consistent, does it say that you are a speaker? If you're waiting for somebody else to give you permission to be a speaker, then you're already a little behind and you may not get hired. I always say like, don't make it really difficult for a meeting planner or a conference organizer to figure out if they can hire you. So you want to let people know that you are a speaker. So one of the things that you'll see me do on like my Instagram because I'll do this on my Instagram stories is like after I have a meeting, like a pre-event meeting, I will go on to Instagram and I will start talking about it. You know, getting people like, oh, wow, those are the questions that she asked. Those are questions that I probably should ask. But the other reason why I'm doing that is so that anybody who's watching my stories is going to be like, oh, I didn't know she spoke for that industry. I didn't know that she was still speaking. I thought she was just a speaking coach. You know, so there's all these different reasons why I do that. After an event, I will also talk about the event. I will talk about how many people were there, whether it was in person, it was virtual. But I just want to let my audience know you can do the exact same thing. Make sure speakers in your bio. Make sure you talk about different events before and afterwards, and maybe even how you're preparing for it. And also on your website, make sure you have a speaker page. Now that's different, much different than putting that you're a speaker on your about page. I want you to think about this as you're a meeting planner and you come to your website. Does a meeting planner have a place that they feel like, oh, this is where I belong? If not, if you're if they have to hunt through your website to figure out if you're a speaker, then you're not doing a great job. I want it to be so easy that a meeting planner comes to your website and says, there's the speaker page. I need to go here and look at this. And on my website, my speaker page has the three different speeches that I offer people. But you'll also notice like on the bottom, it actually says your title here, because I can actually customize a program. And a lot of times I will customize my titles. And that's one of the things that I work on with my clients is that we come up with different titles. It might be the same presentation, but depending on what the theme of the conference is, or if it's a retreat, depending on what the theme is, if there's a theme, I want to make sure that the title reflects that theme. And that just makes it, it just makes it a lot more fun. So that's a couple of the things that, um, that, you know, people who hire speakers are looking for. Um, Also, like if you have any photos of you as speaking, you know, do you have those kind of speaker, those pictures on your website, you know, make sure that they're out there so that if I come to your website, I'm like, oh, this person is definitely a speaker. I'm seeing pictures with a microphone. Um, If you're just getting started, I would, you know, my advice to you would be to always ask for a wireless handheld microphone. I want the pictures of you to have a microphone in it so that there is no doubt that you are the speaker that's in that room. You are the speaker that's in the front of the room versus having just a little lavalier. You know, those are great, but let's get some pictures of you holding a microphone so that there's just no doubt 
that you are speaking to a good size audience because that's why you would have be holding a microphone. Here's another great question that I get a lot. What if you can't promote your services or your products? Well, that's where storytelling comes in. And I would have to say that this is part of my secret sauce for in-demand advantage. You know, how I help you tell stories about what you do, the transformation your clients get to experience, the different speeches that you have. What I teach my clients is that we kind of like we drip them into the presentation so that people in the audience, subconsciously, what we're doing is like, oh, she's got a speech on sales. Oh, she does a mastermind. I want the audience to know all these other ways that you can help them. So why do I do this? And why should you be doing this? Is because I want the audience, especially if you can't self-promote your products or your services, I want people to come up to you afterwards and say, um, so I understand that you have like another another speech. You know, I'm part of a committee for this other conference and we're looking for a few more speakers. Or I want people to come up to you and say, so you mentioned some group program. Could you tell me a little bit more about it? Is it on your website? Do I have to get on your email list? Like I want people coming up to you and you getting spinoff business. As a matter of fact, this is how I got into this space. I helped a woman who had a failing business. And when we were done, I helped her craft this very compelling, captivating and converting presentation. And she spoke to a small audience. She walked away, failing business. She walked away with three full paying clients. And this was in a situation where there was no self promotion or promoting your services or your products allowed. But it's because of the way that I teach my clients, you know, to actually infuse that in their presentation. And it never comes across as salesy. So if this is something that you want to learn how to do, I want to encourage you to book a call with me and we'll talk a little bit more and I will share the different programs that I have to work with me one-on-one or in a group setting. Next question, how do you write a new speech? Okay, I am a very visual person. And one of the ways that I write a speech is I literally grab a a book of sticky notes and I will think about, okay, who is it that I'm speaking for? Who's in the audience? What's the goal? Both the goal of the meeting planner and also my goal. So in other words, my goal is always, what's the gift that I want to give the audience? What do I want them to think, do, or believe differently when I'm done speaking? You know, what is it that the meeting planner, what's the transformation that the meeting planner wants? So then I kind of like put those two together and I know what the goal is. Kind of like the Stephen Covey, you know, think with the end in mind. So that's where I'm headed. Now, in order for that to happen, in order for the audience to think differently, to do something differently, to believe in something differently, what has to be in the presentation? So I literally will start thinking about all the different stories and all the different points that I want to make. So if you can imagine, my wall will then have a bunch of sticky notes. But this is how I start, a bunch of sticky notes. And then I start organizing them. Like what's what would be the first story? What would be the next point? What would be the next point here? And and I sort of just organize them. And then I also decide like what stories go with what points. And then I just kind of like look at the whole thing. Okay, what stories do I not need? Because most likely I have more stories than I actually need. I might even have more points than I have time for to be able to share in a presentation. So that is basically how I do this. I brain dump, I brain dump with sticky notes, and then they're scattered all over the wall so that I can see everything at once. And then I start basically trimming. What can't be in there? What do, what do I not have time for? What is so valuable? It has to be in the speech. So that is how I write a new speech. And most of my stories I tell over and over again. So I know my stories. So 
I might need to freshen up on a story that if I, especially if I haven't told it in a little while, but there's a lot of key stories that I have that I use over and over again. I just share different lessons at the end that I want the audience to take away. And again, those lessons will coincide with the goals, both for the meeting planner and for myself for that particular presentation. What was your best and worst speech? Mm. Okay. My best speech is the answer that I've given throughout the years is always my next one. It's always, I'm going to improve. I get better with every presentation that I give. I want to, I want to learn a little something that I want to take away a little something like, what would I do differently? What story do I wish I had told a little different? Or maybe what story did I forget to tell that I wish that I had told? So I'm always getting better. So my, my best speech is always my next one. What's my best podcast? It's always my next one. I just feel like I'm constantly getting better and better. And I always learn from my previous, you know, if you've ever heard me speak before, or maybe you've been listening on this podcast for a while, I do talk about looking in the rear view mirror to move forward. And I know like the industry always says, don't look in the rear view mirror. But I believe by looking in the rear view mirror, that's we can take that information to move us forward quicker, faster, more efficiently. I want to learn from my mistakes so that I don't make them again. So worst speech. I wouldn't say... I had a worst speech, although some of the speeches like in the very beginning of my career, like I was just so green and didn't know as much about human behavior and neuroscience as I do now. And I really incorporate a lot of that into my speaking. But I would say there was um, a meeting planner that wasn't very open. Like I wasn't even charging her to speak. So me taking the time away from the office meant that I was losing money. And I would say like, you know, like in the beginning, like I bent over backwards a little too much. And, you know, for somebody to say to me, you know, like right up front, I'm sorry, I'm not going to write you a testimonial because I'm just too busy. I mean, that like really hurt my feelings, but I did handle that very, I would say professionally. So I wouldn't say that was my worst speech, but I would say I learned a lot from that particular situation. And again, that was very early on in my career. I really, I did have a book that I could sell in the back of the room. So I would have made some money. So this is a, I've talked about the story actually before, um, how it's okay to start to say no to speaking events. Let's see. One more question. Uh, any advice on mistakes to, to avoid? Yes. Don't wing it. Do not try winging it. Do not try to think to convince yourself that, oh, I'm just good if I just like write down a couple of notes on a piece of paper. You know, there is an art and a science to speaking, to crafting a presentation. You know, my in-demand, you know, advantage, the way that I teach my clients to write a compelling, captivating, converting presentation so that your audience has the three R's so that they are raving about you, remembering you and referring you. Don't wing it, whether you're getting paid or not. If you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, then you know that I'm also a big fan of getting paid on the back end, getting paid you know, with clients, selling products, filling up your programs, that's where you can make a large amount of money versus like, you know, if you get paid to speak, that is wonderful. But the back end stuff is where you really get spin off business is really where the money's at. Don't wing it. Again, like my, the process that I use with my clients, like I teach them to, you have to grab people's attention. Then you got to tell them why they have to continue to listen to you. Then you have your compelling, you know, content, and then it's wrapping it up, and then also infusing the sales stuff so that it doesn't sound salesy, so that you get that spinoff business. That's all of that subconscious stuff that I teach my clients. So one would be just don't wing it. Practice. 
especially if you're new. You know, I'm at a point where I have been speaking for years where I can like, okay, don't have to practice as much as somebody or as when I first started, but I'm still practicing. I still like rehearse my stories. I say them again and again. How do I want to act out my stories? How do I want to move on the stage? How do I want to move virtually? These are all things that you don't want to wing. You know, one of the things that I love is engaging with my audience, asking them questions, even virtually. So I would, so the big thing would be don't wing it. My second piece of advice would be have a pre-event meeting. You want to talk to the meeting planners or the committee, you know, and the day of, or the day before, you know, if you are at an in-person event or even a virtual event, make sure you like connect with the tech people. Let's do a tech run. Let's make sure everything works. Even when you do that, things are still going to go wrong. Things are still going to go sideways. So the other, the other thing I would say is always expect something to go wrong. And if you expect things to go wrong, then you're never going to be disappointed and you're never going to be like so frustrated. Because remember, your job as the speaker is to make the meeting planner look like a rock star. You want to make them feel like I hired the right person. I hired a pro that is making me look good, that's making the the event look spectacular. And so what if a little bit of glitchy tech stuff happens? What's going to be your workaround? And sometimes that's where the improv comes in. I've spoken on improv here before, so you always want to be prepared. You know, one of the things that um, my clients do say, even when they've never spoken before and then they hire me, the first time that they speak, they always almost unanimously have said, I felt like I had five years of experience. You had prepared me so well on what to expect, what could go wrong, you know, how to handle those things. Because I'm always just sharing my experience with my clients. So those were some great questions. And if you have a question that you would like to ask me, either shoot me a DM over on Instagram, or the next time you see the ask me anything question, feel free to ask. But if you are dying to tell your story, if you've got this little voice inside of you that is saying, I have got to start being the speaker, because you want to impact more people, you want to help change people's lives. You want to share, you know, like your advice and your solution with more people. Then I want to encourage you, like, book a call with me because I work with high achievers, people that have amazing everyday stories. And I will teach you how to tell your story in a way that gets you booked again and again and again. So if that interests you, you can either go to chat with LA or down below, you will see a link to actually book a private call. And until next time, I want you to be in demand.